This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. This is your friendly reminder to please rate and review the podcast on the Apple Podcast Store so that others can find it, as well as interact with me online using the hashtags hashtag deconversion, hashtag secular grace, and hashtag humanism is people. I also want to hear from you if you would like to tell your story of deconversion on the podcast. Get in touch with me at gracefulatheist at gmail.com. Now on to today's show. My guest today is Dave Warnock. Dave is a former evangelical of almost 40 years. He was a lay leader and a pastor for much of that time, until he deconverted approximately seven years ago. Dave's deconversion cost him dearly. Some of his family members rejected him, and ultimately it cost him his marriage. In early 2019, Dave received more devastating news. He was diagnosed with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a terminal illness. Dave says he is dying out loud, and that that really means he is living out loud. Dave has an incredible story and an incredible perspective on life, on deconversion, and the finite nature of the human life. Marila Page of the Everyone's Agnostic podcast got myself and Dave connected for this interview, And I want to thank her personally for for doing so. And I mentioned in our conversation with Dave that it's very clear to me that Cass and Marie and everyone else who's ever been in contact with Dave dearly love him. The level of affection that people express for him is just overwhelming. And I think that'll come through in this interview as well. I do want to say that going through the editing process, I noticed that some of the things that were funny to Dave and I as we were having the conversation don't necessarily come across through the audio. Some of that is the twinkle in Dave's eye that I got to see in the video of our interview. I recommend, and I'll have in the show notes, a YouTube link of Dave speaking to a Unitarian Universalist church about his experience. And in that, you get a sense of his sense of humor and the twinkle in his eye. And I just want you to picture that as you're listening to our conversation today. And now I give you Dave Warnock. Dave Warnock, welcome to the Grace Latheist Podcast. Good to be here. Glad to meet you, David. So Dave, I want you to tell your story uh, in your own words. We're going to get to where you are at in your life today, which is pretty dramatic. But I do want to start kind of from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your Christian bona fides. I understand you were a Christian pastor for quite a long time. Yeah, I had an up and down pastoral career, if you will, because part of the time I was a Christian, I was um, a lay leader. Other times I was on staff at churches as an associate pastor or a youth pastor or a worship leader, all the little jobs that are needed in church life. I came into faith as a as an 18 year old um, out of high school, just out of high school, stayed in that faith for the better part of three and a half decades, 37, 38 years. It's a little vague. I know the exact day I got in. I don't know the exact day I got out. Right. So I just dove into the deep end as a Jesus freak back in the, in the Jesus movement in 1973 and was full on uh, expecting Jesus to return soon. So we had to win the lost. We did, I did coffee house ministry and street ministry and was very, um, very zealous for my faith, carried that through getting married at an early age and as at, at an age of 23, was married for a long time, raised three kids. All of it was all in what I would call charismatic evangelical. That mm-hmm. was the tribe we were in, which included speaking in tongues, uh, believing in healing and, and gifts of the spirit. Our view was that the Bible was the inherent word of God, inspired word of God. It was true from first to last, and it was to be taken literally, and that if it was in the Bible, you could do it now. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That was the, that was the uh, tribe that I was a part of for my whole life up until seven, eight years ago when I came to the conclusion it was all false. 
Okay. Uh, we share a fair amount of, of that story together. Uh, I'm maybe just a little bit younger than you, but I got, I came to Christianity in my teens. And yeah. one of the first things I did was hooked up with a guy who was a Jesus freak from the seventies. And we were doing, uh, you know, church on the street, witnessing to people. So right out the gate, witnessing and spreading the gospel and trying to convince people to, to come over to Christianity was kind of the beginning part of it. The reason I start with that question, Dave, is I expect that you get this often, and it's a common topic on the podcast, is that I think believers who hear these stories, they want to say, well, you probably weren't a real, you didn't really were saying, well, you weren't a real believer. Yeah. Maybe you didn't really believe in your heart. And I think it's, it's very clear that uh, you know, this was a core part of who you were as a person for, for quite a long time. It was my identity. And anybody that tells me that, that you weren't really saved, then no one can be saved. I'll say that. Yeah. No one can give more than I gave. So that's a real, and people, uh, Christians, when they're confronted with people like you and me, they have to fall into one of several tracks to try to explain it away. Either you weren't, weren't ever really a Christian or you're just mad at God or you just want to sin. Mm. I did plenty of sinning as a Christian. I didn't need to <laughs> quit believing in order to go sin. Yes. Uh, so none of those things make, and, and I realize why they do that because they have to have a category to put it in or it gets a little too scary for them. And, and they're afraid because someone who knows me well knows how deep I was into it, how full on I gave myself to, to the Christian message. And, it, and they would have to look at me and say, wow, if, it, if that can really happen to you, if you can completely lose your faith, it's gone it's vanished, then they have to look in the mirror and say, whoa, whoa it, could, it could happen to me. I, I got to get away from this thing. Absolutely. I, I imagine that it's, it is terrifying to uh, the believers in our lives. Like I, I, yeah. I treat, treat my family and loved ones who, who are believers with kid gloves all the time. I'm holding yeah. that. And, and with compassion, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole tome that we're angry atheists, that we're mad at God, that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm not mad at something that's not there. That's like me going out in the backyard and, and railing at a unicorn that doesn't exist. I don't do that. That's called insanity. And, and so I'm, I'm also not mad at Christians. Now, I do get my ire up about some of the things that Christians do and I used to do and preach and think that cause people real harm and mm -hmm. that do damage to human beings. Now, I will get my hackles up about that, but I'm not angry at a person because I know they're just doing what they think is best. I understand how they think because I thought that way for a long time. And so I was just doing the best I could until I learned better. And then now, right. I, now I just say, I'm trying to do better. I don't keep thinking a certain way because I think a different way now, and it's impossible for me to think that way. I can't go rethink or unthink what I'm, what I've done. I can't do it just right. no more than I can go believe in Santa Claus now. Right. I, I said, so we say often that faith or belief is not a choice. You are either convinced of the thing or you're not. And many people don't believe that. They don't believe that it's not a belief, that it's right. not a choice. They, <laughs> right. they just can't accept it. And even my own daughters, my brother, who's a pastor, there's a lot of people in my life that are still waiting for me to repent. My mom, and return to God, and as though it's something I can do. And I tell them, you might as well be asking me to grow a hand out of my head. Yeah. I can no more do that than I can just make myself believe in this God that I no longer believes there. It's just, I can't do it. So in a, in a life story that has a couple of painful points, uh, one of the things that leaped out at, out at me as I was reading your story is the loss of some of the relationships with your family. Is that something that you'd be willing to talk about? How, how did that happen? What were those conversations like? Yeah, it was my two daughters. Uh, the church, the last church I was in was really more like a cult, very uh, controlling and manipulative and, and, you know, just dictated all facets of your life. And I was on staff there and I was being who I am. I was independent and I wasn't towing the line far enough and the pastor and I came to heads came to to differ and he fired me because I was independent and so when that happened my daughters who are married to men at the time who uh, who are married to men they're still married to them but mm -hmm. at the time 
these both these young men were on uh, in an intern program at the church, and they were being groomed by the pastor for leadership. So he had them firmly under his wing, and he was rejecting or pushing me out and pulling them in. And associated with them, my daughters kind of got in the position of looking at dad as this rebellious, independent man who's coming against the church and God's authority. And they saw me as this rebel. And the pastor's approach to those kind of people was to put them out of fellowship and shun them Mm, and not, not have anything to do with them. There's verses you can find to support that behavior. No, not, don't even eat with them. There's a passage that says. Mm-hmm. So my daughters took that literally uh, because their pastor said that they should. And so they shunned my wife and I. And that went on while I was still a believer for quite a while. Wow. And so we tried to get back into good graces and find ways that we could bridge that gap and find things I could repent of with some kind of integrity. And about the time I was rounding in that corner was the time I was going through my deconversion process and I was losing my ability to believe in God anymore. And about a year or two down that road, I came to the conclusion through my research and study and thoughts and developing my own thinking, I came to the conclusion I no longer believed in God, period, done. It was gone, vanished. And when I told them that, then they rebooted the shunning and we've had very distant if if not non-existent relationship since then which has been that was in 2009 when i was fired about 2011 when i lost faith so it's been about eight years wow well, i'm very very sorry to hear that i know one of the things we discuss a lot on the podcast is trying to build bridges to the believers in our lives and trying to treat them just as you said with compassion with understanding, uh, and sometimes that can be incredibly challenging. It sounds like that was the case. Yeah, yeah. Now my son, I've got a son who's the younger of the three, and he's good with me. We've maintained relationship all along because he was not in the church at the time. He was away to college, so he kind of escaped that fire. So it's been troubling off and on. I mean, at times we uh, they would we would try to reach back. We'd see him at a wedding or a funeral or something, and we exchange some pleasantries, but no relationship to speak of. And I've maintained my stance that I'm completely open at any time to engage in relationship and to be in each other's lives. It led to the end of my marriage about three years ago because my wife was also the recipient of that broken relationship. So she wasn't able to see her daughters and her grandkids. And I was just, we were becoming more and more distant because she remained a believer and I wasn't. And it's, it's often the case. This happens. Not, not, it's not uncommon for a marriage not to make it through this kind of big changes. Well, I'm in the middle of that. So I'm very much trying to, to keep the communication lines open. We just had a pretty hard conversation just a week ago that. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I hear, I feel you, my friend. <laughs> it's tough. And, and if you're going to be real and honest and authentic as a person, which I became it became increasingly difficult for me to do that and remain married to a woman who, who was embracing the doctrines and the theology that I found problematic, the exclusion of other faiths, the, the uh, non-acceptance of LGBT, the idea that there's a hell that, that their God created for people like me. Those, those, yeah. those, I got a problem with that. And, you know, it's, I understand how the thinking goes, but I don't agree with it. And I find it, more and more problematic and I'm getting more and more vocal in speaking out against it mm. because I think that we have to. Again, one of the, the themes of the podcast is about the being human, fully human. And part of that is being in relationship with other human beings. And yeah. it sounds like since your deconversion, you've made lots of connections with other non-believers, non-theists, atheists, agnostics, what have you. And I hope that has been fulfilling for you as a, as a, somewhat of a replacement as it were. It really has been. We've, I'm lucky in, I live in Nashville or near, near Nashville, Tennessee, and we have an incredibly large group of a community here of ex-Christian atheists and many ex-clergy like myself. In fact, my best friend, I live, I live with them in their home. He and I are former pastors and, and we've become best friends uh, in the last three years, having connected through the clergy project Mm-hmm. which is that online forum for clergy who no longer believe 
And so I've met a lot of people through that, but we have literally, I, I have, I feel like I have the best support system, the best community around me that I've ever had in my life. All kinds of people, all ages, just I'm rich with friends and people in my life that I can be who I am with and authentic and, and genuine and they accept me and I accept them. And I just can't ask for more than that. Those are real friends. So, you know, I, Dave, we don't know each other. Uh, you know, I've been reading your story, but the one thing that, that just leaps out at every, every reference that I see to you is how much people love you. <laughs> uh, we got connected with, uh, from Marie LePage from the Everyone's Agnostic yeah. podcast. And I know that Cass and Marie talk about you often. And it's just with such endearing love that they have for you. It's amazing. And so if I knew nothing about you, I, I would know that, uh, you know, you are a good person, a loving person, just based on the way that other people describe you. I, I do hear that a lot, David. I, I appreciate you saying that, but it, I, I think it really is true. I feel that kind of affection and love. And I'm, I'm just, a, even when I was a pastor and, you know, I've heard this phrase and I've said it before, some people are better than their theology. Mm. And I was that way. I've known people that way. The theology that I had to embrace as an evangelical Christian was oftentimes troubling and problematic for me. And I was always a people person. I was always someone who wanted to get with people and get in the middle of their problems and run toward their pain. And so I've kind of, I think you reap what you sow. Mm. In, in a lot of ways. And, and so I've, I've gotten that back many fold because people do, they're, they are drawn to me. I do know I have that kind of personality and it's not something that I've created or have anything to control over. It's just what it is. And, mm. but I just love people. I love their stories. I love their humanity. I love everything about what makes a person unique and what makes their story valuable because every single story is. And I love that. Yeah. The uniqueness of our stories. I, I love that statement. Uh, some people are better than their theologies. Uh, you know, I, as a Christian, I, I describe myself as a, a grace junkie. Yeah. And, and now as, as an atheist, I'm trying to develop a secular grace that I think grace is always about person to person. It was less about the vertical aspect of no, I just how, thought it was how we treated each other. <laughs> it's being gracious to one another. That's all it is being kind and gracious. And I'll say it. I've said it many times. I'm, I have more, my morality is better now than it was as a Christian. Mm, I'm yeah. more moral as an atheist than I was as a Christian. Christians get all up in arms about that. How can you have morality without God? You know, well, it's pretty easy. Actually, you be kind, you be generous, you love people for who they are. You don't judge one person over against another. You don't separate and divide people. You're just a good human and you try to be a good human to others. It's really not that hard. Yeah. So you're telling me post deconversion, you didn't go on, uh, you know, a, a, a killing spree and <laughs> a rampage of any kind. I know. I love what Penn Jillette says. He says, if we, I forget, I'm going to misquote it, but he, I just read it the other day. And the reason I thought about it, if you're not, if you don't love God, how, can, how come you're not killing all the people you want? He said, I do kill all the people I want. I don't want to kill any. I do rape all the people <laughs> yes. I want. I don't want to rape any. It's not hard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, Dave. So several years after your deconversion, you started to notice some physical changes. You want to walk us through what you started to discover and where that led to? Yeah, it was kind of a, a, a progression of I, I deconverted, lost my faith, began to rediscover who I was. Part of that process was deciding to end the marriage and start over at, late in life in my early 60s, basically rebooting my life. I, I really look at it that way where I, I actually went away to a beach and, and worked on the, on the coast and did my insurance work in Alabama and lived in a condo for two and a half months, just restarting everything from mm -hmm. zero. So I moved into an apartment in Nashville and was just living the best life I knew ever and loving life and living well and lots of friends. And then early this year in February, I start, well, last, last year I started noticing things. The symptoms always start slow. 
and mine were in my fingers and hands uh, where I was having trouble with fine motor skills and dexterity and things, little things were being troublesome and I realized something was wrong. And of course the internet can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And mm -hmm. um, I knew that ALS was on the table as an option. So I waited till the first of the year because of insurance and knew, I knew once I started going to doctors, there would be a series of them and tests. And I, and I, I was right. And after a very conclusive test on a, on February 26th of this year, I was told by a neurologist in no uncertain terms that I have ALS. Mm -hmm. And so that was a game changer. That was a life changing moment. Very quickly after that, I made some radical decisions to retire from working, to move in with friends and not live alone, to sell off stuff that I'd never use again, like my guitar and my golf clubs mm -hmm. and make plans to travel as much as I could while I was able to. Because with the degree, with the disease, you don't know how it's going to progress. You don't know the speed with which it progresses. You don't know where it's going to go next. It could go to my tongue where I can't talk. It could go to my legs where I can't walk. I'll eventually lose the ability to use my hands. So while I can do the things I can do, I'm kind of in a hurry to live. <laughs> yes. I'm on a rampage to do things. To I'm doing speaking gigs. I'm doing podcasts. And this has kind of all happened organically as my story has unfolded and I'm interested in talking about it. And so I'm really ramping up my efforts to go as many places as I can and do as many of these kind of things as I can, because I don't know how long I'll be able to. Hmm. I went to Italy for a trip that I'd actually planned last year. I went ahead and did that in June and, and I'm tentatively planning to go to Europe again in September because international travel will become increasingly problematic mm -hmm. because things are just more difficult. And I don't know about the trip coming up. I'm actually thinking that I may not go because one reason is I really don't want to, I'm more, I'm more interested in doing as much of this as I can right now. I feel right. very, I feel a, an urgency to get my message out there. If for lack of a better phrase, my message, but I feel really an urgency to talk about these things. Absolutely. I've listened to your story and I understand that some of the believers in your life uh, have handled this less well than the non-believers in your life. But even in general, I think Americans, Westerners don't handle the concept of death well. I think being as a human being, recognizing that death is a part of the process, death is a part of being a human being. And having to deal with that, having to address that is a part of being a hu human. Yeah. And dying out loud is nothing more than living out loud in my view. Um, because that what you said is reality. Death is, you know, the Bible, I think Christianity really messes this stuff up. It makes the Christians that I've dealt with in this process are more, they seem to be more in denial of my situation or ignoring it or just not comfortable with it or whatever they're thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't really know because I'm not hearing much from them. Wow. And occasional I'm praying for you. My mom and sister came to see me. They really wanted to see me what, as they called my people. Cause they couldn't, they couldn't figure out who was going to take care of me early on. Mom says they live down in Texas, my sister and mom, all my family's down in Texas and they're all evangelical Christians. And mom was saying, who's going to take care of you? You know, you don't have any family there. You're not, you know, she didn't say this, but she's thinking you're not in a church. Uh, you need to come here or we need to come there. Who's going to take care of you? Mm -hmm. And I said, mom, I, it's fine. I got all kinds of people taking care of me. I got a family that I've moved in with. I've got tons of friends that are swarming around me like bees what can we do? What do you need? How can we help? I mean, literally, it's constant. They're so fucking annoying, these friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, I'm really, I'm surrounded by people who care and want to help. And I was talking to my sister a couple of days later, and I said, I'll try to get out and visit when I can, because, you know, I'm really busy right now. But she said, no, no, we've decided we want to come see you, because we want to meet your people. Oh, wow. And that was her phrase. And I thought, I get it. I see what they're thinking because in their mind, if, if, 
if it's not family and if it's not church, who could it possibly be? Yeah. Where could I be finding community if I don't have those two entities in place? They couldn't conceive of the idea of atheists who are angry, wicked people caring enough about a, another human that's not their family member to take care of him toward the end of his life. They can't conceive of that. Yeah. And I realized that their minds are so locked in to those two realities. It's either got to be family or church or it doesn't exist. I saw that they were baffled and they came and they met my atheist friends. Nobody was eating any babies. Nobody had any horns coming out of their head. <laughs> yes. Just normal, good, loving, kind people. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask the unoriginal question that just <laughs> leap, leaps out. Uh, and that is, uh, and I'll set it up just briefly. When I, I deconverted about four years ago or so, 2015. Okay. And for the first few months, I just felt like I was waiting for a shoe to drop. Oh, yeah? You know, I felt like I, I started a new position at work, and I thought, oh, something, you know, it's going to get messed up. It was kind of my dream job. I'm still in it. It's, it's my dream job. I'm very happy about that, but I thought, I'm going to lose this. I thought something terrible is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am not a superstitious person. I was right. not a superstitious Christian, but you, I couldn't help but be kind of overwhelmed by that. And uh -huh. as I have talked to people who have gone through this deconversion process, I hear this over and over again, that people live in fear that something terrible is going to happen. So mm -hmm. when you got the diagnosis, was there any part of you that thought, you know, maybe this is punishment? Maybe this is, did I bring this on myself? Not, not for a nanosecond. I, I think my process of leaving faith was, maybe different than others. Um, one of the first ideologies I let go of, even when I still was considering myself a Christian, was the idea of hell. Mm -hmm. It was always a distasteful notion to begin with for me. My brand of, of Christianity was very positive oriented, what God wants to do for you and his blessings in your life. It wasn't this negative, you dirty, rotten sinner, you need to change or God's going to wipe you out. It was and there's two different slants that Christians take in their approach to the Christian message. And my slant was always very positive and upbeat. Mm -hmm. And those were the environments I was in. So hell wasn't a big hanging over your head factor. Right. It was this inconvenient truth that we kind of didn't like to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> and so I remember reading, reading Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. I, I, it was one of my gateway books, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I, I just didn't. I wanted to read it because I've read all the controversy about it. And I remember in a Barnes and Noble one day picking it up and kind of looking over my shoulder. Yes. <laughs> like I was looking at porn or something yeah. and, and hoping nobody saw me. And I read the thing in the, in the bookstore there. I didn't buy it. Okay. Cause it was like contraband. You can't buy this stuff. Yeah. And, and it was a, it's a small book. And I remember thinking he's right. Mm -hmm. It's clear. There can't be a hell. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. So when I, when I deconverted and, and let go of that, I never had this sense of impending doom. I just knew it was bullshit. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I got the diagnosis, I didn't have any sense of, of God's judgment coming after me, not even a hint of it, and, and not even a, a nanosecond thought to pray, oh, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, yeah. I messed up. You know, I, oops, <laughs> I didn't have any of those thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, I think, I think after a few years, uh, that goes away. Like I, I definitely don't yeah. feel that I anymore. So maybe, maybe, you know, definitely had enough time. I do know that some of my listeners are probably thinking, well, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> so it's good to hear from you that, you know, even with a devastating diagnosis like this, you were, you yeah. listeners, that. it ain't real. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. No, it's, that's, I, I really do. I mean, that's one of the things I talk about the most, the concepts of uh, the evangelical Christian concepts that are the most troublesome. And that's one of them. The idea that a, a, a loving God would create a place called hell for eternal punishment for a vast majority of the human population down through history is just one of the most ludicrous ideas that I think mankind has ever come up with. Mm. And yet people embrace it. 
I just visited with a, a young man or a man who was a, a, a youth in the youth group of a church I helped pastor back in the 80s in Arkansas. And I was over there and he's a gay man. And he was, he was always gay, but back then in those churches, you can't be gay. Right. It's not okay to be gay. Yeah. And he grew up with this shadow hanging over him, the guilt, the shame, the confusion. And he got himself out. He's living a wonderful, full life. He's a beautiful, wonderful human being. And we just had the best reunion and caught up on, on all this. But at one point I looked at him and I said, so you're telling me his mom's still going and she's 70 and I know her very well. And I said, so she would look at you and tell you to your face, if you asked her point blank, mom, what do you think is going to happen to me, your gay son, mm. if I die in this, in this condition and I don't repent of my sin, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to go to hell? And he said she would look at him and say, yes. Wow. And I just find that stunning, yeah. just stunning that otherwise rational Normal human beings could say that. Yeah. I just, I can't, I, that's when I get, that's when I lose my shit, man. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, my mom became a Christian right before I did. It's a long story. She was yeah. drug and alcohol. She got better for a brief period of time. One of the things she used to just to drive her nuts was people would say, you know, the first time they meet her at church, they'd say, oh, are your parents saved? And implied in that question is, are your parents going to hell? <laughs> you yeah. know? So like this person you, you hold dear that you love, are, are they, you know, a degenerate going to hell? And, and, and so when you start to unpack that, what, that, what they actually think, what they actually are believing, it, it's terrifying. Yeah. And I, I, I want, I want more and more to confront Christians with that unpleasant notion of what it is they're really believing when you break it apart. It's one thing to have this generalized, theoretical notion of heaven and hell when you die. And, and, and I'll just say evangelical Christianity was all about what you believed. Mm -hmm. You had to pray the right prayer and believe the right thing. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is son of God and was, and died for your sins, then, and only then are you destined for heaven. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are, what kind of a life you live. It's all about what you believe. Right now we taught that. Now we taught that, once you believe, then God will help you act better. Yeah. That was never borne out in actual results, but nonetheless, <laughs> yes. Yes. we believed it and taught that. Yeah. But the core of what makes you right with God, you ever heard that term? You need to get right yeah. with God. Before oh, you yeah. Die. Are you right with the Lord? Make things right with your maker. All those concepts of something's wrong with him and you, there's, yeah. you and him are at odds. And you got to make it right by confessing your sins and asking forgiveness. That's what salvation is all about. And so what I present now in my talks and with conversations with people is this idea, this theoretical proposition that this could be true, that Anne Frank right now is in hell and Ted Bundy right now is in heaven. Mm. Based on Christian theology, that is a very real scenario. Now, we don't know if Anne Frank prayed a secret prayer as a little Jewish girl before she was killed by the Nazis, but she was a Jew that was not converted to Christianity. Ted Bundy, we know, according to testimony of other people, prayed to repent of his sins while he's in prison before he's executed. According to that, the thief on the cross, today with, you'll be with me in paradise. Ted Bundy's clapping and dancing in heaven and poor little Anne Frank because she didn't pray the right prayer. Bless her little heart. She's burning in hell today. Now that, my friend, is some fucked up shit. <laughs> yes, 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 it is. So I guess the other thing I wanted to talk about is there's a sense in which religion in general, not even just evangelicalism, but just religion in general is kind of at its core, strip away the cultural, cultural things, the morality, what have you. It's, it seems to me that it is about the fear of death fear of death, of, of losing the people that we love and coming to grips with the fact that, that we are finite human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that to be true? And how, in a, in a very present, imminent way, are you handling the finiteness of your life? Yeah, that's a, uh, 
that's a really tough one because we all live with this general idea that life is finite. We all know it in theory. Again, it, it breaks down between theory and practice. But we, we live with this sense that we know that we're temporal beings. I think that's why the concept of heaven was created mm -hmm. to give us this notion that there's something more than this in case this isn't all that great then maybe there's something better on the other side and also hell was created to keep us in line because if you don't tow the line here there's that waiting for you so get it together buddy right <laughs> and so i think those ideas were created by religious people back in the day um, because there is this great unknown and we don't like to not know we don't like questions that don't have answers so if Back in the day when there was thunder in the sky, what's that? That's scary. Let's call it a God. Let's, yeah. let's attach some thing to it. And so that's how I think those things developed over time. But as far as how I'm living now, when you're confronted with the reality that, you know, we all know that the, the road we're on, at some point the bridge is washed out mm -hmm. and we're going to go over the edge. And And we might think that, well, that's, hundreds of thousands of miles down the road and I can't even see it from here. Well, me now I can see up ahead. Yeah. That that bridge is washed out and this road is going to keep going and I'm going to go over the edge. So it just makes me more cognizant of the end. I think my reality is I'm not as concerned about that final day or night when I wake, when I go to sleep and I don't wake up, however that ends. Mm -hmm. I intend to have a part to play in that, by the way. So I'm going to get to choose when, I've, when I'm saying, okay, enough, I'm ready. Yeah. But until then, the nature of the beast that I'm wrestling with is such that I get, I'm going to be able to do fewer and fewer things as time goes by. Mm. I just drove my car by myself to Little Rock, Arkansas, Sunday, and came back Monday, and handled the suitcases myself, did everything myself, all by myself. <laughs> Look at me, all by myself. Yeah, yeah. But there is a day when I won't be able to do that. Mm. I won't be able to drive my own car. I won't be able to feed myself. It's becoming more difficult. Things get heavy in my hands. I won't be able to dress myself. I won't be able to wipe my own ass. I won't be able to bathe myself. Mm. Those are very real things that are coming up for me that I have a glimpse into that most people don't. So wrestling with the mental, the mental part of that is my real challenge. The actual ending, the death, to go to sleep and not wake up, that's not all bad, you know? Yeah. I, I like sleep. <laughs> so it's, it's the part that, I'm, that I have to deal with on a daily basis of every time I do something, I'm thinking, when will be the last time I get to do this? And that's the mental mind fuck that works the hardest on me. Right. The death part is not a big deal. I mentioned that part of my mom's story was recovery from drugs and alcohol. And one yeah. of the things in the 12 steps is about an attitude of gratitude. One of the things that always struck me, they talked about is it's hard to be grateful for the big things, you know, the, the very large things, but to recognize your gratitude for something tiny, a warm mm -hmm. blanket someone to talk to the, the very little things can be profoundly gratitude inducing. I understand you've had, you have a bucket list. You're, you're doing the international travel. You're telling your story. Are there little things that have become more profound to you now with this diagnosis? I I've learned to appreciate the little things more. Um, and that's a lot of what I'm talking about. A lot of my message is, when I call it dying out loud, I'm really talking about living out loud, which means living on purpose and living with an awareness of what life is and can be and how beautiful it is and how precious it is. And I talk a lot about these two phrases. Both of them I had in my apartment before the diagnosis. One is a little plaque that says, we do not remember days, we remember moments. Mm. And that is a message I've had in my in my lexicon for several years now, which is this, uh, life is nothing more than a collection of moments. That's a mantra that I live by. It's not a, there's not a big overarching plan and a scheme and 
we have to fit all the puzzle pieces together and this thing's happening because that thing's happening because this thing's happening. It's just life. Life happens. Shitty things happen. Good things happen. There are good people. There are bad people. There are angry people. There are nice people. So what we can do is we can live life in such a way that I'm making room for good moments. I'm recognizing good moments. I'm taking extra time to let good moments happen. I'm mm. slowing down. I'm not getting frustrated with little annoyances that normally would, would derail me. And so those are the kind of things that we're trying to, I'm trying to talk about living more intentionally so that you recognize the little things that you said, the, the grateful things, being grateful for having friends to gather and have conversation with and laugh with and cry with and share life with being grateful for catching a beautiful piece of music hmm. or, or uh, having a moment on a beach somewhere and realizing how beautiful it is and how lucky we are to even get to see that. Exactly. And not, not missing that, not, not letting that become blasé or, or a casual occurrence, but stopping and saying, wait, God damn it. Wait, this is a moment. Don't miss it. And I've said that I've stopped my friends on several occasions in the last few months and said, listen, guys, stop, listen, stop. Mm -hmm. This is a moment. Don't miss it. This is a moment. Absolutely. I love the way you say that, that it's a, we remember the moments. Uh, and Oh yeah. And the other phrase is stitched on a pillow that I've had for several years and it says carpe the fucking diem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the fucking day. And that's, that's an intentional way of living of saying, if it's go out there and make it happen, you know, live yeah. your life, live it on your terms, do what you know is right. What you know is best and, and write your own story. Right. We won't regret the things we did. We'll regret the things we didn't do. I've heard that said often. Yep. And it's really true. It's really true. Uh, so I, I'm cognizant of our time. I, I've got just a couple more questions. And, yep. and, and uh, one of which is, I think, an area that the secular side has to grapple with a little better is this idea of grief. Yeah. Uh, many of us, we've gone through this deconversion process and we, we lose people we love. We have our, our bodies are, are dying. You're experiencing it both from the loss of your abilities as that progresses and with the knowledge of death coming on. How are you handling as a secular person the, the grief that you must feel? I think better than I would as a Christian. And I say that to, for several reasons. One is, one of the challenges I had as a Christian, and I think they still have, if you believe that there's a, a loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God who's managing things, and we're praying and working with God and in tune with him and hearing his voice. And, and when stuff happens in life, the, the thing we always had to do was figure out where, where's God in this? Mm -hmm. You know, someone's killed in a car wreck, somebody's child or something happens. Some loved one has cancer. Where's God in this? What's God saying? And so everybody's scrambling around because he's, he's hiding. He's silent. He's invisible. And so we've got to do all the work to figure out what God's saying. Something's wrong in that equation, but we never quite grap grappled with that very well. We didn't, we didn't snap on that. I listened to one of your speeches. And I love the way you said this. Uh, you said it's exhausting trying to come up with excuses for the barbarity of God. <laughs> love that phrase. That's amazing. Well, it's great to quit. I, 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 when I finally could quit making excuses for that asshole God, I thought, <laughs> oh my God, I, I, it's, I, was, I didn't realize how exhausting it was. Yeah. And the same thing with something like this. I don't have to try to figure out where God is in this. What's God saying? What's God's will? What's God's plan? It's just happening. Mm. So my friend Cass says this, say yes to what is. It is what is, and I can either kick against it and wrestle with it and get frustrated and get mad, which I do at times get those ways. Mm -hmm. Or I can say, okay, this is what's happening now. How, I'm gonna, how am I going to deal with it? And my response to that is simply, I'm gonna live the best I can as long as I can. 
with this and and i'm going to move downstream with it i'm not going to try to swim upstream i'm going to move downstream and get all i can out of it the grief part is not the grief of dying as i said before i think dying is the natural result of living it's mm -hmm. just the next step it's not an enemy like the bible says and then the bible also says that people are kept in bondage through fear of death well quit fearing it <laughs> Jesus, just let it go yeah. what's the big deal yeah so the grief is losing the ability to do things that make life fulfilling yeah because to, i've always said this from the from the first day i got the news i'm all i'm more interested in the quality of my life than the quantity of my days mm -hmm. i want my life to be fulfilling on my terms what i want to do now as i lose the ability to do things i'll have to adjust my expectations and dial that back and and come to a place of what am i willing to give up what am i willing to do without until i get to the place where it's not i'm not okay with it anymore hmm. and the grief part of this whole process is just grieving the loss of the beauty of life and i've said before i'm not afraid of dying i'm afraid of not living yeah I'm afraid of missing things. I'm afraid of doing, not doing things I, 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 sh I could do and should do because of some stupid reason. Carpe the fucking diem. Carpe the fucking diem, man. What do I have to lose, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so uh, last open-ended question here is the typical listener of my podcast is early on in the deconversion process. Okay. What would you say to them? What are the kinds of resources they should be looking for? Where can they find the communities that, that you have found? First of all, I think it's getting easier than it was when I came out. When I lost my faith, I knew no one. I didn't know where to go to find, of course, the internet's available now. So I started Googling stuff and I found the clergy project and I found some other resources, but there's tons of stuff out there. And one thing kind of leads to another. You find this one, then you discover that one and you meet this person, then you, so that will happen. Um, there's a young lady in our area here near Nashville that reached out to me after hearing a podcast I was on and she said it, it moved her so much and she wanted to, I talk about bourbon all the time. She wanted to buy me a bourbon. And so she lived close and didn't know anybody and was needing community. And so I've started getting her connected to our community and she's just ecstatic finding her tribe. Right. Um, so I would tell your listeners, I know it's hard to begin with. It, it really is hard. You, you lose so much. You're, you're confused. You're disoriented. You don't feel like you have anybody you can talk to, but they're out there. We're out here. I can, any of them can reach out to me. They can reach out to you. There are more than likely people in your community that you just don't know are there. Right. And we can help connect you with them. So as you start reaching out, you'll find, oh my God, this person lives in my town. I need to go have coffee with them. And you yeah. develop friendships and that helps you through the process. And, and the process is really this. You're having to rediscover who you really are. Mm, that's true. And that can be very daunting. And, and you're also dealing with trauma often. You're dealing with rejection. You're dealing with sometimes being closeted with family members. There's all kinds of dynamics at work and it just it just isn't easy but we're out there and it gets easier and the further removed you get from it the more you kind of go what the hell was i thinking <laughs> right <laughs> yes yeah and you become more aware of who you really are more comfortable in your own skin more at peace with yourself i can honestly say i am more comfortable with the man that I am, the person I am, the life I'm living than I've ever been in my life. I'm more at peace, even as a dying man. I just live an authentic, honest, open life. I don't have to apologize for anything. I don't have to, I mean, it's just easy. It's just, it's, 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 it's gonna be okay, listener. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Dave, I think you are living the truest, most authentic, uh, life and you're you're living it out loud. I think that's an, an incredible message, as you say. I'm glad that you're 
doing this kind of podcast tour and speaking to her. I hope that everyone gets to, to hear your story. How can people reach out to you if they've listened today and they want to get in touch with you? Real easy. Um, I've got a Facebook page. Reach out to me on Facebook. It's wide open. It's called Dave Warnock, W-A-R-N-O-C-K, Dying Out Loud. And it's just a, it's a public page. It's got all my calendar on there. It's got anytime a podcast is released, it gets, it gets posted on there. Um, video of, of speaking gigs, uh, the blog post that I'm writing. And then my email is simple, daveoutloud at gmail.com. And I love hearing from people. I do. And more than that, I love meeting them in person. If we've connected online and going to be in an area and people are coming, I, I fucking love that. It's the high, <laughs> uh, hugging a neck, looking somebody in the eye and just the human connection is just what is beautiful to me. I just, ne it never ceases to amaze me how beautiful that is. That's the meaning in life, my friend. It really is. And it's, it's no more complicated than that. So yeah, I would love to hear from anybody. So carpe the fucking diem. Carpe the fucking diem. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for sharing your time and your story. This is incredible. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Some final thoughts on the episode. As you just heard, Dave has an amazing perspective on life, on deconversion, and ultimately death. He has an incredible sense of humor. Uh, I hope that came through in the conversation. And if it didn't, as I mentioned in the intro, please check out the link I will have in the show notes of Dave speaking at the Unitarian Universalist Church. And just again, the twinkle, twinkle in his eye. I like to often have a time here where I quote the people from the interview. Uh, there's so many things that come across that I'd love to, to mention. I'll just mention a few here. Dave, speaking directly to you, the listener, about the fear of, of hell or the fear of punishment from a sadistic God. It ain't real. Let it go. I love the way he said that. He talks about, we don't remember days, we remember moments, and life is a collection of moments. And to recognize when you're in a moment, to say, wait, God damn it, wait, this is a moment. Don't miss it. And ultimately, carpe the fucking diem. I love that from Dave. Dave also says, I'm more interested in the quality of my life than the quantity of my days. It's going to be okay, listener. It's going to be okay. And lastly, the human connection is beautiful to me. It never ceases to amaze me how beautiful that is. I could not have said it better, Dave. I want to thank you for being on the podcast. This was an incredible conversation. I hope that my listeners really appreciate the kind of wisdom that we have just heard. And if you are interested in getting as much Dave Warnock as you can get, he is on the World Podcast Tour. So friends of the podcast, Matthew Taylor and Andrew Knight have interviewed him both on the Ask an Atheist Anything podcast and on the Still Unbelievable podcast. Check him out there. I know that Ryan Bell has interviewed him on the Life After God podcast. And I believe Dave is just doing the wide tour. But he is often referred to and has been on multiple times the Everyone is Agnostic podcast, so check him out there, as well as Marie LePage and Cass Midgley. And I want to again thank Marie for getting Dave and I connected. I very much appreciate that. Love all of you guys. All I can say is carpe the fucking diem. I'll catch you guys next time. Time for some footnotes. The song is a track called Waves by Micaiah Beats. Please check out her music. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to help support the podcast, here are the ways you can go about that. First, help promote it. The podcast audience grows by word of mouth. If you found it useful or just entertaining, please pass it on to your friends and family. Post about it on social media so that others can find it. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This will help raise the visibility of our show. Join me on the podcast. Tell your story. Have you gone through a faith transition? You want to tell that to the world? Let me know and let's have you on. Do you know someone who needs to tell their story? Let them know. Do you have criticisms about atheism or humanism, but you're willing to have an honesty contest with me? Come on the show. If you have a book or a blog that you want to promote, I'd like to hear from you. Also, you can contribute technical support. If you are good at graphic design, sound engineering, or marketing, Please let me know and I'll let you know how you can participate. And finally, financial support. 
There will be a link on the show notes to allow contributions, which would help defray the cost of producing the show. If you want to get in touch with me, you can Google Graceful Atheist, or you can send email to gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can tweet at me at Graceful Atheist, or you can just check out my website at gracefulatheist.wordpress.com. Get in touch and let me know if you appreciate the podcast. Well, this has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Grab somebody you love and tell them how much they mean to you. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. <laughs>